ideas, new models, and new implementation uh, strategies. And this, uh, this approach, uh, which was, as I say, begun in Daegu with the Daegu Declaration, uh, is, I think, a very important part of uh, the process. And I just wish to mention that the, the uh, headquarters were just voted yesterday by the board of the International Solar Cities Initiative to be headquartered in this city. So the international headquarters will be here. And uh, Professor Kim Jong-dam from Kung uh, National University will uh, preside as the leader of ESCI for this purpose. So I think this is one uh, very important strategy. Uh, and uh, I would like to now briefly spend the remaining moments I have on a second uh, strategy, which is how to innovate the energy economics relationship so that we can move more quickly uh, green energy options uh, into uh, society. Okay, so let me uh, now begin to develop that argument for you uh, with a, a sort of two-part suggestion to you that the economics of the new energy are different than the economics of the 20th century. You might expect that because if they were the same, we could simply continue down the path we are on. The economics are different in two fundamental ways. As we now enter the 21st century, this is a case of the U.S., but I think you can find this in most parts of the world. The cost to save energy through improved technologies, through improved information, and through improved management techniques is almost always cheaper than supplying the next increment of energy from the conventional system. So, for example, these thin blue bars in the U.S. for different regions from New England so you go from the East Coast to the West Coast by going across this graph. These bars represent what people pay in the U.S. retail prices for electricity. The top of the bar is what uh, households pay. The bottom of the bar is what industry pays. And you can see that there is always a large gap between what we pay for the next uh, kilowatt hour of electricity and how much it would cost in each of these jurisdictions to save kilowatt hour of electricity. This is based upon data that was assembled over 10 years. This is actual performance. It is all costs. It is the customer cost plus the utility cost plus if the government has put in subsidies. It is all costs in. The cost per kilowatt hour is always somewhere between half to one third the cost of providing new uh, electricity. And that uh, is an important feature of the economics of new energy that is different from what we had in the 20th century. Usually in the 20th century, as we built out new capacity, the price per unit of energy went down. Uh, what we are now seeing is that it, is, it has either flattened or it has begun to grow. By contrast, the ability to save through more intelligent technology uh, and more intelligent uh, management of our energy uh, services it is now cheaper for us to go this way. So less is better in the case of uh, the 21st century uh, than more uh, from the 20th century. A second uh, feature, this again is drawn from the United States, but you can see uh, similar features to this. The horizontal bar is the retail electricity price uh, snapshot here in the U.S. that we took from 2011. So this is the average price across the U.S. And each one of these bars is assembled by two pieces. Without the incentives that are in policy in the United States, the cost for geothermal would be here. The cost with those uh, uh, in, in incentives are here. And you can see for each one of these uh, that the, uh, the uh, incentives are important, especially here. Uh, with uh, solar uh, energy technologies, these incentives are very important. Now, sometimes people look at a graph like this and they say, so this is the levelized cost. This is the cost over the entire lifetime of the equipment. How much per kilowatt hour? And uh, sometimes people say, yes, but those incentives are uh, a form of a subsidy. I just would offer that if you look in any society, every single energy source we've ever used in modern times has received some level of incentive. There is no such thing as a free market uh, in the case of energy for very good reasons. Energy 
is so critical to economic development and to national security that we always provide some level of uh, incentive for their, for their use. So I would just suggest to you that uh, the fact that there are incentives in the renewable energy family is nothing new. This is all part of how, over uh, the last hundred years or so, we have procured uh, energy not only in the U.S. but abroad. Now, the point I would like to make with this is that in some cases the technology still has improvements needed to make it more cost effective. But we are getting very close to grid parity with the renewable energy options. And as we get closer, that will give us a second leg of a new uh, uh, economic paradigm for new energy, that the energy services will be dependent upon not their fuel costs, because renewables differ fundamentally from non-renewables on that. It will not be fuel costs that will define what the next uh, increment of energy will cost you. It will instead be who puts really good infrastructure in place okay, to utilize uh, this technology. So these are the two features uh, that I think are very important uh, for, um, uh, for these, uh, 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 for these uh, uh, new economics that we're going to be looking at. There is big gains, potentially, um, if we go this route. And again, these are American uh, numbers, but I have seen studies of this kind done in Asia uh, and Europe as well. And basically, if you are looking at this question of energy and economics, you should ask, what is the development implications? What happens if I make the choice to go toward new energy? What happens economically? And uh, the best available evidence we have is that you will actually get a bump upward in your energy, in your economic development. Investments in energy efficiency and conservation will typically uh, generate three to four times as many jobs, for example, as conventional uh, 20th century energy options. In the case of renewable energy, it can be anywhere from two and a half to five times as much. And an area where uh, Korea is particularly strong uh, in the case of information and communication technology, you can get the bounces that are well over four, seven times as many jobs. So there is an economic development strategy inside the new economics, and we need to try and capture uh, this kind of option as we build uh, uh, to the uh, 21st century energy and economic relationship. Well, having told you that, you will probably not be surprised, at least some of you in the room are probably very familiar with, the result of uh, this kind of new energy, new economics, is that many expect enormous economic potential, not just small, big, big, big economic potential. So uh, one uh, uh, consulting group that has made a lot of money uh, on making uh, estimates of the economic potential of new energy is the McKinsey Group. And the McKinsey Group's uh, forecast for the United States is that the US would make about $1.2 trillion if it invested in new energy uh, by uh, you know, just a, a, a decade out, which is not bad. I mean, 1.2 trillion, that's stunning. Um, and uh, that we would have an enormous job growth, 600,000 to 900,000, uh, and in the process, we would cut our overall energy needs by 20%. Really dramatic that kind of things. But I'd like to suggest to you, this is a very optimistic picture, and many don't believe this picture is accurate. Okay? It's not this good. If it was this good, why haven't we done it? It's not this good. But even if you look at more, uh, less optimistic uh, picture, not, not, uh, uh, not as optimistic picture, you still see uh, a scenario like this. This comes from the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. And the blue bars are the estimated um, uh, energy efficiency opportunities in different parts of the, of the uh, economy, the public sector, governmental buildings, uh, nonprofits, and so on. Residential, here. Commercial, here. Industrial, here. A great deal of opportunity uh, somewhere in the vicinity, not the 1.2 trillion, more like 200 billion, that could be captured cost effectively with estimated paybacks, the time it would take for the savings to pay back the cost of seven to eight years. So still very impressive, even in a less optimistic uh, scenario analysis. But I want to draw your attention to this black line here. This is the rate at which the US is actually investing 
in this offer. So against the $200 billion potential, the U.S. is investing at about $4.5 billion. An amazing level of underinvestment. Why does the U.S. underinvest, and why does much of the world underinvest in these two technologies? And I'd like to suggest to you, this is my, uh, my second prong, the problem is that we have a finance system to move new technology into the marketplace that's based on the old economics, the economics of the 20th century.